The first thing we look for, aside from having experience in working as a a software engineer or a developer, uh, aside from you know having that experience, a good mentor has to be somebody who can communicate with students, and th that seems obvious. But a lot of times we have mentor applicants who are very experienced, but are lacking the empathy uh, or the ability to to sort of think what, what it's like for a student who doesn't know the stuff that the mentor knows. And that's hard to assess, but that's probably the most important thing that we look for is the ability to uh, sort of put themselves in a student's shoes uh, or in a student's situation and, and understand, you know, what, why are they freaked out about X topic or, or what is what is so hard about this one thing that the mentor learned 20 years ago and doesn't seem hard. Those qualities, they're common, but they're not universal. We have to screen for more than just experience. Uh, it's great if somebody works at an Apple or a Google and they want to be a mentor, but if they don't have that ability um, to, to put themselves in the shoes of a student, then they're not going to be a good mentor. Yes, definitely. Uh, that's I mean, that's like the only goal that I have really is to help students get jobs and change careers. In person, I've I don't know how many hundreds of students have helped get jobs online, thousands and, and thousands, and certainly uh, through Springboard, through the online courses, it's a much smaller number because we have a much smaller group of students. But um, so far, we've had every student who has been part of the course and graduated and gone through all the, the program, every single student has gotten a job. The short answer is yes, lots of students go on and change careers and get their first job. At this point, I have students who are engineering managers or you know, very relatively high level senior engineers or principal engineers at companies ranging from super tiny companies to Uber and Google and Apple and Amazon. Students have started their own companies and have you know, been their own engineering team at, at times and then grown that team. So we have students kind of all over the place who are working. Uh, but yes, the answer is yes, students do get jobs. The last year has really changed things in a lot of ways, but um, out of all the careers, out of all the sort of adjustments that have had to been made, I think in the engineering or software engineering, web development world, things have been the least painful probably. There's been the least amount of having to recalibrate how you get work done or having to adjust workflows or, you know, I think of some of my friends who work in um, like retail clothing design and they're used to being at a t like with a team looking at fabrics and inspecting things and, and passing samples around. That can't be done remotely very easily. It's a lot of mailing stuff back and forth. It's a lot of you know adjustments. Of course, there's been a lot of remote work. There's been a lot of transitions in terms of where developers are working. But the tools they're using, the way they're working is still the same. You're still writing code on a computer. You can still do that anywhere. I think the bigger transition, the biggest change going forward is going to be figuring out that balance between fully remote work and there's a million articles, think pieces, like this is nothing uh, revolutionary, but figuring out that balance between full remote work and having people come into an office or some in-person work in some contexts, because there is a difference, I, I think. Working fully remotely it works great and many companies have been fully remote. Uh, many like engineering companies or web development companies specifically has been, have been fully remote for a decade or more. But there are times where it, it's certainly beneficial to have someone come into an office one day a week or something like that. So I think there's gonna be a bit of a swing back towards some form of a, a like part-time office at some point. I think for, for my students and for people who are learning to code and starting out, it's been a great year for getting jobs. Um, if you could say anything about the year has been great, it's been a good year for becoming a web developer and especially for becoming a web developer in smaller markets. If you don't live in you know, the Bay Area, New York City, London, Hong Kong, that sort of thing. You might live in a small town, but you can work for one of those companies still and, and you don't have to move. You don't have to, you know, take your your kids or your dogs or whatever into a, move into a small apartment somewhere. You can stay where you are and I think that's been great. And I, I think that will continue to be the case for a lot of companies. I'm sure there will be many companies that sort of go back to a mixed model or maybe full in person, um, but it's expensive to have an office. I think a lot of companies 
companies, especially coding sort of web development related companies or e-commerce companies, like the engineering teams are going to be the last ones to be called back into the office. The last thing I would say is for some students, that's not a good thing. And a lot of them that I've talked to want that in-person experience. They want to be able to, you know, work in an office and, and remote work is great for a lot of people, but it's not, you know, the, it's not a universal uh, path to happiness. Well, it's certainly a tough topic. Um, it, it really depends on where particular students live or job applicants live. Ageism in particular is a challenging topic. It's one that is frustrating to me. Um, I guess any discrimination is going to be frustrating. Uh, but I've seen it it's in the Bay Area, especially uh, with some of the, the students I've worked with in person who are up there in their, their age, uh, getting into their 60s or even early 70s. I've had some students, um, but honestly, ageism starts before that. I've had students who are, you know, in their, their 50s um, who are parents and they're applying for exciting roles at companies run by people younger than me and, you know, in their early 20s. It sucks that that happens, uh, that there is some form of discrimination, but ultimately in the end, I've, you know, those students did succeed. Um, that's not to say that it wasn't a hurdle or not a problem, it absolutely was a problem. With enough of a portfolio, with enough uh, sort of personal uh, referrals or recommendations, enough interviewing, they all landed jobs and it, it all sort of worked out in the end, but it absolutely is something worth considering. Um, I think with remote work, especially uh, increasing and <laughs> increasing very quickly in the last year, there are, have been a lot more opportunities for people to work, first of all, work in markets where they're not located, but also work with um, companies that hopefully aren't going to have some of those problematic hiring policies or, or sort of discriminatory interviewers. Um, I don't think it's ever like an explicit thing not to hire somebody who's older or somebody who's a parent, but in the Bay Area, this is my own generalization, absolutely, but a lot of the, the young sort of tech startups that I've been around and had some of my students work at, a lot of the time they just end up hiring sort of more young people like them, people who want to go out to a bar with them and you know don't have kids at home. So having more remote work, having more opportunities for uh, parents to be at home with their children, having more of those opportunities I think has been uh, a, a big positive in a lot of ways. The last year has been negative in a lot of ways too, but I think one of those one small positive I've seen is a lot of students uh, who are older, who have families, who have kids of their own, are, have been able to get jobs much quicker than they may have uh, a year or two ago. Many of the companies that I've been around do have uh, initiatives or diversity initiatives that they focus on a lot um, and they have improved upon, but age is sort of on the sidelines or is often ignored. Um, which is frustrating. And there's a lot of really good students I've worked with who had to interview twice as many times to get a job just because they were, you know, 10 years older or 20 years older than some of their uh, their peers in my courses. It's hard enough to balance life with the rest of life. You know, somebody's a, a college student or someone's a parent or someone just you know has stuff going on like it's it's always a challenge um, in person it's something uh, my boot camps that we run up against all the time things happen in people's lives and big things like major events tragedies weddings all that stuff but then also just day-to-day -day, uh, changes to structure or how someone's feeling how much energy they have how much time they can devote to homework for example what i think is most important and especially online this is probably 10 times more important than it is in person, is having some form of structure, some form of routine or discipline. I am not personally a disciplined person. Um, I have to force myself, if I'm trying to pick something up, I'm trying to learn something, I have to force myself to be consistent, set up a schedule. Otherwise, it's so easy to deviate and forget or just ignore something and procrastinate. When you're talking about picking up something large, a big skill or multiple skills like software engineering, 
whatever your schedule is, the specifics don't matter. If you're doing nights or weekends or every lunch for three hours, you know, two days a week or whatever your the time is that you're allocating. What matters is having that time and having a set structure and, um, you know, devoting time to it. I would say the, the more time you can devote, the better. You won't have the same experience if you're doing one hour a day for like, I don't know, 10 months versus doing uh, three or four hours a day for five or six months. Having that higher frequency interval makes a, a bigger impact. It helps you retain things. It helps you sort of build that familiarity with the concepts. If you're doing something just for a tiny bit at a time, it's a lot harder to pick it up. Um, it's kind of uh, the difference between you know, trying to learn a language, doing an online little game or some of those uh, training. Uh, I guess they're useful, but for me, uh, I like pick up one or two words at, uh, each time and maybe that's it. Comparing that with like moving to a different country and immersing yourself, obviously you're gonna pick up that language much faster if you're speaking it every day. So what matters is consistency. That's what it comes down to. Ideally, we could have every student devote their entire day to it, but that just is impossible. It's impossible even in person. We have students leaving for appointments. We have students you know, taking naps because they're tired. Uh, it's just part of the process. So structure and, and trying to force yourself to have that structure is most important.